Well, this should be easy because we've covered most of this already. Uh, Alan Turing's paper on um, computing machinery and intelligence, the one in which he proposed the Turing test, and then my critique. The Turing machine you already know. It's a symbol manipulating device that recognizes zeros and ones or squiggles and squaggles and uh, acts on them, manipulates them according to the state that it's in and its state is determined by its dynamics and the dynamics in, in the case of a digital computer is determined by a computer program. So a computer program tells the machine what to do when it sees certain symbols. Um, this theory of what computation is turns out to be true for all um, proposed formal models of computation. So probably a Turing machine is uh, as good a formalization as any of what, sim of what computation itself is. Uh, the Church-Turing thesis, which is not the same as the Turing machine, is the thesis that, um, first of all, the Turing machine captures what is intuitively meant and practically meant by mathematicians and physicists by computation. And the stronger version of the Church-Turing thesis says that uh, it also, a, a computation, any Computation in this sense can also simulate computationally just about any other physical process in the world, any other dynamic process. So you need dynamics to implement a computation. A computation on written squiggles on paper don't do anything, but once you uh, implement it in an actual Turing machine, then the computation gets executed, if you like. That's one direction. And the other thing is that using computation, you can simulate any dynamical system. You need a dynamical system to implement a computation, and a computation, in turn, can simulate, model, any dynamical system. That's the strong Church-Turing thesis. Model it uh, to as close an approximation as you like. Think of a, um, of a, of a square and then a pentagon, five size, hexagon, etc. It, it gets to look more and more like a circle. It never actually becomes a circle, but you can bring it as close to a circle as you like. That's the sense in which a computer simulation can approximate any dynamical system as close as you like, but it can't be the dynamical system. So uh, a simulation of an airplane can't actually fly, but it can simulate all the properties, the symbolic, symbolically simulate all the properties of, um, of flight and predict them as well and explain them. The Turing test says that when it comes to computation, when it comes to cognition, the way to test whether you have a, a correct um, theory model of how cognition works is to build a system that uh, that has the capacities of a human being and has them to the degree that a human being can't tell them apart, can't tell the model apart from a real person. The email version uh, requires it only to be able to be in Turing indistinguishable in terms of um, pen pal abilities, verbal abilities. T3 the robotic version requires everything, every interaction with uh, things in the world. And T4 requires also um, Turing indistinguishability in terms of all the observations you can make about what's going on inside the head of the person. So the brain, as well as the behavior, is uh, captured by the test. As I've said many times, computation is just a rule-based symbol manipulation. It's syntactic, it's implementation independent, and um, Although it's interpretable as meaning something, the meaning does not enter into the way in which the symbols are manipulated. That's only based on their shape. That's syntax. Artificial intelligence, as you know, is any attempt to reverse engineer uh, cognition, whether it's by computation alone, as in, as in the uh, uh, computer programs that, uh, that underlie um, the T2, or in robotics, where it's a hybrid system including both computation and sensory motor dynamics, including potentially a lot of other internal analog dynamics that's not computational. Think of Shepard's mental rotation. Computationalism is the same as strong AI. Cognition is computation according to strong AI. It's implementation independent, and Turing test is the way to test whether it's empirically, scientifically whether you've succeeded with your reverse engineering. There's the hierarchy, as you know, from toys which are not Turing at all. The difference between a toy and a Turing test is a toy just does a fragment of what we can do and, a, and, and something that's a Turing scale can do everything we can do. 
Uh, in that sense, even T2 isn't exactly the Turing test because uh, we can do a lot more than just email. T3 is the real embodiment of the Turing test, a model that cannot be told apart in terms of what it can do, not necessarily how it looks, but what it can do from a, from a real human being. T4 requires it to be even more like a real human being in the sense that uh, you, can even, you can't even distinguish it if you look inside its head and look at what's going on in there physically, electrophysiologically, and pharmacologically. There should, the the uh, functional properties should be the same for T4 as for a real human being and his brain. We're trying to re reverse, cog cognitive science is trying to reverse engineer all of these capacities, and the Turing test is itself the uh, sort of embodiment, in the same way that the Turing machine is the, is the uh, archetype, the prototype for, for all computation, the Turing test is the prototype for, for all of the uh, experiments in cognitive science, because the, uh, the ultimate goal is to build a mechanism that can do everything that we can do and do it so well that we can't tell it apart from one of us. The mind-body problem lurks in the background, as I said, because besides being able to do things, we're also able to feel. And the question is, is the Turing test, will the Turing test end up also being able to capture uh, the fact that we feel? Capture in the sense of generate feeling. Will it actually generate when it's when it's um, performing as if it understands English or, Chi or Chinese? Would it also, will it also generate what it feels like to be a system that understands Chinese or uh, English? <coughs> the distinction is between syntax and semantics. Computation is just syntax, but it has to be semantically interpretable. It has to be um, uh, the symbols have to be, although they're manipulated only on the basis of their shape, they also have to have meanings and they have to make sense. That's semantics. There are two further arguments besides Searle's against the uh, thesis of computationalism, the thesis that cognition is just computation. One of them comes from Gödel's proof. It was uh, The argument was made by Lucas. He said that Gödel uh, proved that uh, in any symbol system strong enough to include arithmetic, there would always be uh, statements that were true but not pr not computable from the axiom, so not provable. Uh, and uh, what, he, what he argued was that since these statements are true and we can know them to be true, that is, we can cognize them to be true, and yet we know that they're not computable, that means the cognition can't be computation, because uh, how, how else would we know that these things were true um, than, uh, than uh, by computation if the only thing were uh, if the only um, uh, uh, process in cognition was computation. Well, you have to make a distinction between uh, what you can do by computation. Uh, you, can, you can show that the uh, Gödel sentence is a sentence that says, uh, I can't be proven from these axioms. And you can look and show, because that's what Gödel's proof shows, that it's in fact true that, it, that uh, I, uh, my, my truth cannot be computed from these axioms. So you can see the truth, you can verify the truth, and you can see that it, um, uh, that it follows from Gödel's proof. But what it feels like to understand the truth of the axioms could, I mean, I, you know I'm not a computationalist, so I don't think this is true, but it could just as well be computational, because understanding and feeling and the meaning of a statement, the, the semantics of a statement, is not the same thing as computing the statement. So we're perfectly capable of computing the Gödel statement, we're perfectly capable of verifying that the, uh, that the uh, Gödel statement is true. Um, we can't prove that it's true, we can verify it by, by simply taking Gödel's proof. Gödel's proof shows that there is in fact a, a true statement that, that, uh, that can't be proven within the symbol system. All that means is that whatever the process underlying the uh, understanding of the truth of a statement, it's not the same thing as the computation of the co truth, of, truth of the statement. I compute the truth of the Gödel statement by just looking at it and saying, look, this statement is saying I'm not true. Uh, pardon me, I'm not provable. And it is, in fact, not provable. So that's true that it's, that it's uh, not provable, and therefore it's true. Uh, but it's not a proof within the symbol system. Your knowledge, whatever it is, that state of knowing what that means, in the same way that Searle's state of understanding what a Chinese uh, sentence means, is a feeling state. And 
I don't think feeling states are computational either, but certainly Gödel's proof doesn't prove that it's not computational. It could simply be a different computation. It's one computation to prove Gödel's theorem. It's another computation to verify that, that a particular statement is in fact true because of Gödel's theorem and not provable exactly as, as indicated by Gödel's theorem. And it's yet another thing to feel whatever, whatever the process is that generates the feeling and the understanding that this statement is true. That underlying process, I doubt, is computational, but certainly the, the uh, Gödel's proof doesn't prove that it's not computational. Well, if that was too much of a mouthful, don't worry too much about it. I'm certainly not going to ask about it on the exam. The other one is uh, Roger Penrose's argument that because, um, because uh, mathematicians can sometimes see that... It's a little bit like Gödel. It's, it's, since mathematicians can sometimes intuitively see the truth of a um, mathematical theorem before anybody's ever proved it, uh, that must mean that mathematical intuition is not computational. Well, the argument is pretty much the same over here. Uh, who knows what mathematical intuition is? Um, you don't have a proof until you have a proof. So uh, once you can prove a statement, you've got a proof of a statement. When you don't have it, even if you have a hunch that eventually leads to a proof, the hunch is not the same as a proof. And there's nothing that uh, that implies that the hunch can't be computational. Uh, Ro Roger Penrose says, um, well, one of the other reasons it, it, it's not computational, besides the fact that it's a hunch, is the fact that uh, quantum mechanics, uh, in the form of, for example, photons touching the, the retina, quantum, quantum mechanics enters into cognition as well, and quantum mechanics is not computable. So... Um, so maybe what we need in order to capture mathematical intuition is quantum mechanical states, dynamical quantum mechanical states, and not just computational states. Well, even that isn't very, uh, very um, persuasive because, in fact, uh, Newtonian continuous states are also not computational. Remember, the Church-Turing thesis simply said that a um, co computational system can can approximate. Um, a continuous dynamical system as closely as you like, but it can't actually be one. Well, um, classical dynamics would be enough already to go beyond computation. You don't have to go to quantum mechanics. But anyway, you don't have to worry your heads about all of that. That's about as much as you need to know about um, these arguments against uh, Turing's thesis, uh, uh, Turing's test. And I would say that at the moment, Turing's test is more or less coming out of it unscathed. Next week, we'll talk about the brain.